it's Sarah here from BJC Health coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, thanks for showing an interest in one of our educational events. You're about to watch part one. Um, so enjoy the event. If you've got any questions about the content, then please consider joining BJC Connect where you can access all of our facilitators live. Um, otherwise, please consider leaving a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. So Bunyan's, if you, you know, the formal uh, name for bunions, the formal medical name is Halix abducto valgus or uh, HAV for abbreviation. And it is a protrusion deformity of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So that's the joint that sits behind the big toe. Uh, but one thing that I really want people to be able to understand from tonight's talk, one thing I'd really like you to be able to take away is that the bunion is really the end of the story. So bunions uh, occur, or we think that they occur because of complex involvement of other joints that are further back in the foot. And so a lot of treatment is focused on those joints further back in the foot uh, to try and either relieve the pain of the bunion, try and help its alignment, relieve its pressure. So I'll go a little bit more in depth about that. Of course, with bunions, you um, can have, it's a progressive thing. So there are juvenile bunions, which can occur in childhood. Um, juvenile bunions as themselves are a whole topic alone. So I'm probably going to more talk about adult bunions. Um, and they still are a progressive disorder. So they can start as mild, as you can see in these pictures and move along to be moderate, and then severe. And one thing that you should really take from this picture is that as the bunion progresses uh, and protrudes more, it causes the deformity to move laterally across the foot. So if you look at that third foot there, you can start to see that the bunion isn't just the only joint that's involved now. You're starting to get uh, deformity or clawing in perhaps that second and third toe. And then as you move along, you can see that you start to get overlapping and underlapping digits. And so it's not uncommon for patients to actually come into me and they have no pain in the bunion. It's actually all the other problems and deformity that the bunion has caused uh, that is actually what bothers them more. Causes of bunions. <clears throat> So in terms of evidence, we don't know completely why bunions occur, uh, but it's most likely to be a combination of reasons. Uh, and there is evidence that there is a hereditary component to it. The next would be ill-fitting footwear, particularly a history of ill-fitting fit footwear in the toe box. Um, Surprisingly, there's not that much evidence that high heels actually cause bunions. Uh, clinically, I probably have to disagree a little bit with that. But in terms of evidence, uh, it's more the uh, pressure from the toe box, both in the width and the depth. And then one, and so of course, with ill-fitting footwear, that could, could possibly be the reason why bunions are more common in females, um, because we tend to, uh, as we move into adulthood, have more choices in footwear uh, where, you know, we are slave to fashions at time and put our feet through uh, pain compared to men. Uh, then there is this concept of the hypermobile foot. So some of you may be aware of what hypermobility is and hyper meaning extra movement. Um, and that can be, hypermobility can be a generalised thing through the body, uh, but it can, it can actually be in particular in the foot. And there are certain joints that can become hypermobile and they are what contribute uh, to a bunion down the line. Hypermobility can also cause uh, excessive pronation or what you might know as flat, flat feet or rolled in feet. Um, and that, again, I'll go through the anatomy of how that occurs. Some other causes of bunions, uh, we have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which some of you may actually have. Uh, sometimes we see leg length difference causing bunions, particularly if the bunion 
uh, is only on one foot and not the other, or it's much worse on one foot than the other. Again, like I said, it can occur in childhood. And sometimes it can be from repetitive trauma as well. So if you think about sports like ballet, uh, once those people are on point, uh, the forefoot is being overloaded with abnormal forces that it's not designed to take. So without going too much into it, um, the anatomy of the bunion, as I, as I said, I wanted you to grasp the idea that bunions actually uh, can occur from further back in the foot, from dysfunction further back in the foot, uh, and in particular hypermobility. So if you can see those two bones that are shaded in there, uh, the first metatarsal and the first cuneiform, that becomes part of a, a row of uh, bones that we call the first ray. And so the first ray is a really important uh, row of bones in the foot because they actually become our lever. They, become a, they need to be a stable and a relatively rigid lever to push us off for the next step when we're walking. So they play a lot to do with propulsion. So if you have a look at the top uh, picture up here to the left, uh, you can see that when uh, where this index finger is pointing, when the foot is in a better position, further back in the foot, you actually get uh, range of movement through that first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So those two concepts go together. And that's how we get enough range of movement in the first metatarsal phalangeal joint to actually push off for the next step. So when you look at this bottom picture, uh, this is where we tend to strike the ground. We load to the outside of the heel. Well, this is in an anatomically perfect foot, sorry. Um, but if you look where propulsion occurs, we are actually supposed to be pushing off our first metatarsal phalangeal joint and our hallux or our big toe. Uh, and so callus patterns tell us uh, how we're actually pushing off. Callus patterns can be a, an important giveaway. So what you'll often see sometimes, and you'll see in a slide later on, is that there's actually no callus underneath the bunion joint. And that's because it's dysfunctional. So the callus goes to other parts of the foot because the first MPJ says, well, you know what, I'm locked, I can't work. So I'm just going to transfer this job of propulsion to other joints in the foot. And those other joints are not designed for that. So this gives you a little bit more of an idea about how that medial column of the foot, um, the first ray, uh, the navicular, and also even those joints that are further back in the foot, so the talus, which is like your ankle bone and your heel bone, um, how much mobility they have uh, also affects how the first ray functions and can contribute to bunions as well. So x-rays for bunions, often uh, if somebody's in the early stages of bunions, we refer for x-rays because uh, particularly if we want to see progression. So we call them baseline x-rays. Uh, and from those x-rays, we take angles. And you'll notice with the two angles that are taken here, yes, there is an angle taken up directly where the bunion is, which is the hallux valgus um, angulation. But the other really important angle is the one that's further back here, right where you can see this almost unlocking or what we call adduction of that shaft of bone there. And that's the intermetatarsal. So a normal degree for that would be uh, nine degrees or under. And you can see the picture on the right has 19 degrees. And then the angle at the top, which is the hallux valgus, it's, it's definitely greater than 15 degrees, which is the norm for that. It's sitting at uh, 37. The other important thing to take from these x-rays is that the first metatarsal joint and the intermetatarsal angle is not perfectly straight. So a lot of people with bunions, uh, it concerns me that they want bunion surgery because they want that joint to be completely straight. Uh, but that's not how it actually naturally occurs. And through surgery, you can actually overcorrect 
uh, and restrict the joint too much. And then you uh, have a whole other load of problems included, you know, restricted range of movement. The foot's still going to get movement from somewhere else. So when I talk about bunion surgery later on, I talk about, you know, being realistic about a reduction in the angle rather than having this idea that you're going to get this perfectly straight joint. And so this is where <clears throat> this is where orthotics might make a little bit more sense about what their role is um, with bunions. And we still don't have enough uh, measurement and evidence-based practice on uh, orthotics and bunions and how successful or unsuccessful they are. But the interesting thing to look at this um, here is that the controlling part of the orthotic, so the strong part, or the supportive part, it actually finishes behind the bunion. It doesn't extend under the bunion. And so this hopefully reconfirms for you that the role of the orthotic is working on the joints further behind the bunion, okay? There can be padding. There can be padding that goes past the shell, and you can see that on these two pictures. But the aim of the orthotic is actually to stabilise those rear foot joints, those joints behind the bunion that are contributing to it. Um, <clears throat> there are, and I'll talk a little bit later about a, a type of orthotic that extends past there, but uh, that's in a particular situation. But generally, and, and I'm actually surprised how many patients, when we give them orthotics for bunions, they don't say to me, oh, but it, it doesn't go under my bunion. It actually doesn't touch my bunion. And I'm like, yeah, that's why. <clears throat> because it's actually working on stabilising the joints further back in the foot uh, to try and improve the alignment and the pain as well. But the other important thing about orthotics is that you can't over-control that joint either. And uh, actually jamming that joint can cause just as many problems. So that's up to the job of the podiatrist, that they actually prescribe an orthotic that stabilises and supports those joints but doesn't jam or overcorrect them. The foot still needs to be able to go through a certain amount of natural motion. And I think too, that's, you know, sometimes I see patients who come in and they already have a pair of orthotics or sometimes two pairs of orthotics and they can't tolerate them. Um, and sometimes that's because the point of control may be too high or too far back or too far forward. Uh, maybe the material that the orthotics be made out of is either too rigid or too soft. Um, and so <clears throat> uh, there's, Orthotics is one form of treatment for bunions, but I just want you to understand why orthotics don't actually go under the bunion. Uh, they sit further back in the foot. So orthotics and bunions, um, as I just explained, it can be to try and stabilise that hypermobile first ray um, and those joints further back in the foot that might be excessively pronating or causing the foot to roll in too much or cause flat foot. As I said, it's to support and stabilise. It's not there to overcorrect. Um, and the evidence is that orthotics help with pain relief in bunions. We're still inconclusive as to whether they uh, reduce the alignment, slow the progression of the malalignment over time. Um, but there is a study out that did come and say that uh, when you combine foot exercises, with orthotics, uh, you actually get better pain relief, particularly in that first three to four months um, of treating the bunion. And that makes sense because when you look at the anatomy of all the muscles and tendons that occur underneath that first metatarsal phalangeal joint, uh, it makes sense that by strengthening these, um, some of these bigger muscles that come in, so that's these ones on the right here, um, even, you know, your calf muscles have something to do with this, uh, your tibialis posterior tendon, the one that comes big and under the arch, but then all these little intrinsic excess, uh, muscles. And look how many of them attach and uh, go over the first MPJ. So there's a range of exercises that can be done as well. And some of them are quite small type movements, um, uh, like scrunching with your toes and uh, movements of out and in against resistance. Um, but it makes sense and the evidence is that 
combining foot muscle strengthening with orthotic therapy is going to be better for that initial pain relief. Look, I, the, the talk on today, I'm mostly concentrating on the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, but I did just want to make note um, that you can get bunions on the fifth metatarsal phalangeal joint, okay? Uh, and these are called Taylor's bunions or a bunionette, um, but they still suffer much of the problem that the first does. And that's because in a very simplistic way, we all concentrate on the arch of our foot, on the inside of, inside of our foot, but we actually have a really important arch on the outside of our foot, the lateral side. So I guess you can think that the first ray is kind of stabilizing the inside of the foot and the fifth ray and all of its bones, the fifth ray and the calcaneal cubital joint, it's stabilizing the uh, lateral or the outside border of the foot, uh, but both can, can form bunions. And unfortunately, some people get both. They get first and fifth. They get the whammy. <laughs> um, so bunion pains and problems. And we'll go through each of these individually and I'll give you some tips and tricks and some treatment options. Um, but one of the most common ones is pressure from footwear. Bursitis, callus and corns, second to fifth clawed toes, second to fifth metatarsal pain, and then osteoarthritis and actual restriction of the joint. So let's start with the first one, which is bursitis. So bursitis, uh, a bursa is like a fluid-filled sac that uh, the body places down to protect a joint that is under pressure, under friction, um, and then that becomes inflamed. So not to be confused with gout, um, but you still do get this uh, swelling. Uh, you can get redness and warmth over the joint. And most of the time, uh, this actually occurs because of just physical irritation from footwear. I don't have bunions myself. I love shoes and I would hate to go shoe shopping if I had bunions. So that's one thing that I want to try and help you with tonight. Um, because that is one of the hardest things for people with bunions is just to find shoes that don't physically irritate the bunion. And the physical irritation cannot just come in the form of bursitis. You can actually get uh, quite painful callus and sometimes quite painful little corns uh, on the protrusion as well. And the easiest way to deal with them is to have the... Uh, podiatrist debride them very carefully. Uh, that debridement um, is a very effective and you get immediate relief. So when we debride callus, we reduce the pressure in the area by about 80% immediately. So it's one of the quickest short-term things that we can do. And because the area is red and warm and swollen, we go back to those typical things like rest and elevation, if you can do that icing of the area uh, and sometimes wearing uh, a little bit of compression, even tubi gauze or compression type sleeve on it. Some people may want to use anti-inflammatories, whether that be in the form of topical uh, creams or gels like Voltaren, uh, or they may already be taking them orally. Um, protective covers we'll go over in a moment. And for the ones that are just <clears throat> chronic and just won't settle down, uh, some, pe some people will consider having a cortisone injection into the joint. As I was saying before, bunions are a progressive problem. So <clears throat> that first joint ends up causing deformity and pain and problems as you move laterally across the foot. So this is this picture in the middle is that perfect story. So there is no callus underneath the bunion. There's no callus underneath the first MPJ, but there's supposed to be callus there. We should all be a little bit firm there. That's where we're supposed to be pushing off for the next step. That's what that joint is designed for. But instead, because of the mechanics of the foot, that joint locks or doesn't work properly or it's restricted. Um, and that causes the pressure for push off or propulsion in gait to be transferred along to at least the second metatarsal head and often the inside of the big toe up in that interphalangeal joint. 
and it's a bit <laughs> it's it, you know and then and then the foot starts to play the uh the blame game so it might then move on to the third metatarsal head and the fourth metatarsal head and even onto the fifth you can see that in that middle picture there's a callus on that fifth fifth head there but uh, it's not just callus you can actually get capsulitis within the actual second mpj or third any of those metatarsal heads uh, some people can have nodules forming over them uh, and, in, in, you know, some type of extreme cases or even say things with diabetes where you just get too much callus and pressure underneath and they can ulcerate. But this is a story of the, of the bunion where, you know, the second joint says, well, it's not my fault. You know, this isn't my job. I've got this job because the first joint isn't working properly. And then the first joint says, well, it's not my fault I'm not working properly. It's because further back in the foot, the first ray isn't working properly. And then the first ray says, well, it's not my fault. It's the, it's the problem of the rear foot, the talus and, and, the, and the heel that's not working properly. That's why I'm in this situation. So that's where I mean that the bunion is, is really just the end of the story. It's, it's actually a very, when, when we assess people for bunions, we're, we assess the whole foot, the whole lower limb actually, because uh, sometimes knee and hip function can affect it as well and even leg length difference. So I hope you get that concept. And I actually, you know, besides physical irritation, I would have to say more people come into me with this pain pattern than actual pain in the bunion. So as you can see that lateral progression, this bunion has caused second, third, fourth toe clawing um, and there appears to be a callus or corn on that uh, on that top of that fourth toe there <clears throat> so this is just trying to show more of those stories sometimes it's not just calluses you can get corns on top you can get nodules on top as well um, and interdigital corns because as the toes move laterally the pressure in between the toes or the overlapping and these can be really painful um, and they, because, you know, there's lots of uh, uh, moisture and things in between our toes, they can actually get infected fairly easily as well. Uh, but interdigital corns are a real tricky one. They're even harder for us to debride because we're trying to hold all the other toes out of the way while we get in there safely. Um, but they have to be kept very clean as well. Bunions can also cause toenail changes. So when you're getting abnormal pressures going through other parts of the foot, uh, you will over time get changes in the nails, whether it be thickening, whether it be that they become amoeba or involuted, uh, whether they become ingrown. And it's not just the big toe, you can see the pressure between that first and second, the inside of that second toenail may actually be coming uh, ingrown as well. And on this picture to the right, you can see the overlapping of the second toe is uh, probably giving an ingrown just up here on that lateral side of the nail. Either someone's cut it out or the patient has themselves. Uh, like I said, callus and corn treatment, uh, first port of call is to have Sharpe's debridement safely done. And the next is to reduce uh, pressure or friction. So uh, I can't tell you how many people come in with bunions and they bring a little bag and that Ziploc bag has got 10 things that they've tried. Every type of device, whether it be padding, dividers, molds, strapping, separators. It's a really, it's a really difficult, um, it's a really difficult trial and error. Um, and what works for one patient doesn't always work for another. But, you know, of all the products available, I do have my favourites. And obviously, they're the ones that I find are most successful for the patient. So one in particular is uh, Silipos tubing. And this is where you have gel tubing inside. And it is elastic and it's, it uh, slips over the toe. It can even cap the end of the toe if that's where the callus is as well. Uh, but it's not bulky. So it's actually really good for cushioning and friction, but it's not bulky. A lot of these devices that people buy, already they've got a bunion that they can't fit into the shoe. And then they're trying to fit all these bulky devices on top as well. And that just increases the pressure. One thing I do want to say about... Um, toe protectors and things like that is you must use caution if you have um, reduced blood flow to the feet. So if you know you have peripheral arterial disease, uh, if you have peripheral neuropathy, uh, if you have diabetes, if you have edema or swelling, or if you have uh, 
tinea pedis, which is like a fungal infection in between. That is because some of these devices uh, I don't recommend because they can act like an elastic around the toe and the vessels, the blood vessels and the nerves in the toe are microscopic, they're tiny. And if you have something like peripheral arterial disease, then you can actually occlude those vessels and stop the blood flowing to the end of the digit. So a podiatrist is able to conduct vascular tests on you um, that can check you've got adequate blood flow. But a lot of this stuff you can just buy off Amazon and things like that. And it just concerns me that people are, are basically, some of them are actually wearing like an elastic band around their toe. Uh, these are some of the better ones that some people use. Um, either gel or foam toe separators. Uh, sometimes this middle one here, we can actually use a silicon mold that we make ourselves for it, for this specific patient. And that tries to prop the toe up, um, particularly when you've got uh, lesions on the end of the toes. Some people wear these elasticized uh, gel bunion covers. Again, you've got to be able to fit it in the foot. And if you do get any sort of swelling around the ankle or the top of the foot, you're going to hate these because they, they kind of cut in like, a, like an elastic vice. One of the best products that I have come across is a hiking or running shoe, uh, but I use it for lots of other things in podiatry and they're called in gingy socks. I just get them off the internet. They're a toe sock, um, but they have compression in them. Uh, they have moisture wicking in them. And sometimes patients have got so much toe deformity, by the time they put all their bits and pieces on, um, you know, it's half an hour down the track for them to get their, their actual shoe on. So the thing I like about the Injinji, uh, as long as you can actually bend and put them on, they can be a little bit tricky. You've got to have enough uh, hip movement and, and hand movement. But it individually sleeves and protects each toe without bulk. Uh, and I use these for lots of things, Raynaud's condition, chillblains, um, into digital tinea pedis, lots and lots of reasons, but uh, particularly for people who've got bunions and have got those deformity in those uh, lesser toes, uh, I find them effective as well. So you've just finished watching part one of one of our recent educational events. Hope you enjoyed the content. If you'd like to access part two, then you need to sign up for BJC Connect. It's a free platform where you can access not just the recordings of uh, past events, but also access a whole range of upcoming future events and access our team of facilitators live. Um, all of the details that you need to join BJC Connect are now flashing up on your screen. But otherwise, like our staff, subscribe if you'd like to see more information from BJC Health. Look forward to seeing you in an event soon.